Māori have always been scientists, and we continue to be scientists. Our science has allowed us to live, work and thrive in the world for hundreds of years. In this program, we're going to show you how these worlds of science are intersecting and how the paths to our future are being formed. You know, our ancestors were great designers, they were great navigators, they were great astronomers and they knew what they were doing. You know, in effect, they were scientists. And so what happens is that by the things that we do with the smart trust and, um, you know, not just the waka things, but everything we do in terms of the traditional knowledge base of our people, starts to show people that we don't come from a history of superstition and ignorance, but we come from a history of uh, science and knowledge. There was a, a, a population survey of the beach to give us a snapshot of Tohiro stocks were and because we had built up those relationships with Kaitiaki, Kuea, Komato on the beach, we went back to them and said, hey, would you like to come and learn about you know, how the scientists conduct their surveys? On the day of the survey, over 30 individuals came as iwi helpers and left as Kaitiaki. We're in Te Parepora. This is the Māori textile store in Te Papa Tongarewa. It's the largest collection of Māori textiles in the world. My responsibility as a conservator is to conserve, treat any of those taonga that are needing conservation. Our biggest problem in Māori textiles is the stability of the dyed black fibre because of the traditional method of dyeing it. It would be very difficult to get a weaver today to reproduce something like this. So we don't want to lose that because once that's lost, that's, that's it. There's scale insects all through this. So here's a lovely bit, just here, where there's lots of scale insects. And if we look in here, the scale insect's sucking the sap in, and then it's pumping it out through the anal filaments. So little drops of sugar are really just the excrement of the scale insect. And what's really cool about it is you can eat it. <laughs> if you look at that, it's like treacle. Mm. <laughs> Now, in the current context, we have the arena running aground at Otaiti. There was oil that was spilt into the water and came up onto the different, um, different beaches, and there was a, a need for a recovery. There was also containers then were distributed at to uh, Marakana, Makatu, and down on the coast. This led to an immediate response to the environmental impact. In terms of our involvement, we had a model that could assess the pre rena state of Modi. It could also assess how the, the Modi was recovering in terms of the four dimensions. And so we needed to get on the ground, talk to the local hapu and iwi, and establish what their understanding of that was. We tuned into a transmitter here that we strap onto a Kiwi's leg. I'll come around until the signal gets louder. And that's where the bird should be, and he's basically in this direction here, where the aerial's pointing. Well done, Ricky, this one's a pleasure. Got him, hello big boy. It's been a while since I've seen you. Isn't it, hey? This is Jess. Jess is, um, Jess was caught as a young female in about um, 2001. I'm very excited. I've been looking after these sea cucumbers for the last year and now they're going to their new home. We're going to put them in enclosed cages and see how they survive and how fast they grow. <laughs> Here we are. Here's how we prepared earlier. <laughs> yeah, hopefully they'll come out looking like this at the end. 
this is done in the context of the international market. China has had a major investment in the farm production of sea cucumbers. They are a premium product if you can produce the quality required uh, for the market. That's what science and research projects are there to over time solve. Hey, Pa.